So at the start of the last session, Om Malik accurately pointed out that I shouldn't quit my day job. Well, over the last few months, my day job has just been having conversations with the various plants all around me. And I promise you, nobody wants to see that. But here is something that people do want to see. It's our next presenters. It's from the money category. We have Jacqueline Reeses from Square and Ann Straders from Fortune. Hi, I'm Ann Schraders with Fortune, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Jackie Reeses, who is the head of Square Capital and Square Financial Services. Jackie, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And I never thought I would say this, but I'm actually envious you're in the office right now. I feel like I haven't been in my office in, in so long, so that must be a refreshing change of pace. Well, I will say it's a tiny little office that only holds a few people in Los Altos, and so it's not exactly a typical office environment. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, I would love to get into, you know, how the pandemic has changed your business. But I think first off, I would love to see if you can kind of set the stage a little bit for me with what's going on with small businesses right now. Um, you kind of have a great finger on the pulse of what's going on in small business world. You know, your day job, you are spending all of your time lending to small businesses and also you're on the Economic Advisory Council for the San Francisco Fed. So I love to start off in here. You know, we've seen unemployment go down a little bit. You know, states are starting to reopen. Businesses are starting to reopen. Do you think we're going to see something like a V-shaped recovery out of this? Or what are your concerns for the small business community right now? Yeah, let me start with small business because I think it's a topic that everyone should understand because small businesses are the lifeblood of the American economy. There are 30, 30 million small businesses in the country, 23 million sole proprietors. And if you think about it in the context of Main Street, if you walk in your hometown, you want to see your community thrive. And communities thrive when you have institutions like small businesses that are part of the fabric of, of society and the way we all operate. And so incredibly critical for job growth, uh, number of people employed in this country and also part of the spirit of the American economy with entrepreneurs and founders uh, in the U.S. There are three things that I see right now uh, that are happening with small businesses. First, many of them have been able to pivot um, mm -hmm. and they've had to think through in short order how to pivot their business. And so by that, I mean a restaurant that is doing online uh, sales of groceries and wine, um, businesses that have created curbside pickup, businesses that were traditionally in store that have transitioned to online and even services. Um, hair care is a great one uh, where instead of actually doing the service themselves, you're seeing people teach uh, consumers how to do their own service. And so you're seeing incredible pivoting uh, with small businesses in order to survive. It leads me to my second point, which is small businesses are struggling to manage their cash flow. Mm -hmm. Typically, small businesses have less than 28 days of cash flow in their savings. They operate with a very tight balance of revenue inflows and expense outflows. Mm -hmm. And when that gets out of whack, like we just saw over the last few months, it creates an absolute crisis for small business owners. And so they're, they're managing their cash flow. And then third, they're trying to manage the transition to how they open and the complexity of that. As we hear it, small businesses are focused on two, two topics on that front. One is how do they keep their employees safe and make them feel safe um, and, and are safe? And the second is how do they keep their customers safe? They want customers to feel like they can come into a physical store or get a service in a way that gives them peace of mind. And that is complicated for small businesses who've never thought through whether they needed to have, you know, gloves and masks and protective equipment in the context of a very, you know, happy retail environment or a service. And so they're, they're trying to figure out how to make it work for their business. Absolutely. And are we starting to see, you mentioned that, you know, you guys have seen a lot of adoption of, you know, going online and doing curbside pickup, but have we sort of started to see these businesses coming back to life a bit, or are there still, you know, places where they really just aren't open, they're still really struggling? 
You know, it's um, it's really a geographic issue, uh, and it depends on how the government is enabling businesses to open up. And I think that's the one unusual factor here that we've never seen in an economy is that the government is having an impact on how commerce opens. Um, having said that, across almost every state, you are seeing a, a pretty significant week over week resurgence in activity from, I would say, an end of March, mid-April nadir. And subsequent to that, you've seen double digit week over week growth. There are still categories of businesses that are weaker. Those are typically service oriented businesses around health and beauty, where in many states, um, even where they've opened up other commerce, that commerce, that's the one category that feels like it is the slowest to reopen. And the second being restaurants, where the ability to increase occupancy in a restaurant is just taking some time as restaurants themselves figure it out, in addition to uh, managing the restrictions in their local jurisdiction. Right. And I think that all kind of plays into, you know, what you guys do and how, you know, you guys use tech to pre-underwrite these loans because, you know, you guys use, you know, machine learning and algorithms to take all this data that's kind of coming through the business, you know, recurring payments, what kind of payments, and you use that to kind of figure out, you know, how to extend loans to these businesses. So I guess my question is, you know, when those inputs look a bit different and when they might look different for a while, depending on, you know, social distancing restrictions and things like that, what, how has that sort of changed the way you guys think about using that data for, for underwriting and how has your underwriting business kind of changed uh, with, with the environment right now? Yeah, it's uh, really interesting. So Square Capital um, facilitates loans to uh, small businesses across the country. We uh, in our uh, last most active quarter, we uh, facilitated about 90,000 loans a quarter. And so we are a very large small business lender. Our loans are typically $7,000. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about who we are serving, it is truly Main Street across America. And what we've seen is that Square Capital is one of the primary and only sources of capital for businesses of this size. And think about it in the context of a coffee shop and their cappuccino machine um, fails on a Saturday morning and they need a new machine and it's $5,000. Where do they get credit and where do they get it instantly? So that's the type of business uh, Square Capital is. What we do though, from a machine learning point of view is we are able to take multiple data sets. So we start primarily with payments data we add behavioral data, meaning device type, device location, all kinds of signals around behavior. And then we also can augment with some credit data, although that's the smallest component of any of our um, uh, underwriting platform because the payments data and behavioral data is such strong signals. Mm -hmm. Up until this period of time, we've been able to infer changes in economic behavior more around natural disasters. You know, if you see a fire, you see um, hurricanes, we've been able to use that data to incorporate in our models the understanding of significant change. And so that was a helpful input prior to this time. I think now that we have the benefit, even though I struggle to use that word in this context, but right. the benefit of this data um, we're able to incorporate it into our models and see lots of different new signals that can help us underwrite potentially even deeper into the credit spectrum uh, than we ever have before. And I think it will also enable us to deal with volatility in a way that we've never dealt with before. Um, and so managing that, incorporating it, and now being able to make sure with new loans that we're facilitating we have the benefit of that, I think will be a very instructive learning. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the other point too is, of course, you know, small businesses in general have just been, you know, absolutely pummeled by this crisis. And, you know, a lot of them are still struggling to reopen. And, you know, that's hurt your business as well, which, you know, that's your bread and butter, those mom and pop, you know, main street shops. So I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, the unfortunate reality is that, you know, a lot of these businesses might not ever reopen again. So I guess, you know, from that perspective, I mean, what does that mean for Square if, if some of these businesses never fully recover from this? You know, we succeed when our sellers succeed. And I love that we're completely aligned behind the growth 
of our sellers. And so with all things related to Square, we put our sellers first and we have done what we could to help them adapt. And that um, starts with things like Square Online Store that uh, we've seen a five times increase in the average weekly GPV on Square Online Store. We've also um, uh, taken our SaaS products, enabled them to be free for multiple months during the depth of the pandemic. And we've also provided PPP loans to Square sellers in order to support them through, for cash flow in whatever way we possibly could. And so I think we tried to lean into those places where we thought with the advent and use of technology, the ability to have a mobile device in the hands of sellers and curbside pickup, that we could help support their ability to very quickly pivot with equipment they potentially already had, with a system they already had, um, and a relationship that could help them move very quickly in order to be able to change how they operated their business um, to help them succeed through this crisis. Right, and so I guess for your business too, for Square Capital, I mean, I think a lot of that depends on how quickly these businesses are able to, you know, get those payments back up and, and secure themselves as well. So, I mean, what does that mean for you guys in that portion of your business? And if you're kind of waiting for this pickup to happen and, you know, the longer it takes, you know, the, the probably the harder it is for you guys, how are you sort of thinking about, you know, when this might restart and, and how you're going to kind of pivot your own business to, to kind of meet those needs? You know, I think, um, I don't think we actually had to, pivot square. I think what we did was focus on products that we already had in our uh, development uh, portfolio that at some point in 2020 and things that we saw were more urgent that needed to be executed in order to help sellers pivot. We moved them forward and make sure that we were able to serve sellers immediately. And that could be something like curbside pickup or it could or a gift card directory. Um, both of which we released very quickly, or it could be something like PPP. And PPP was started out of understanding a need, and we launched it within a few weeks of starting the development of the product. And I think that's where we've tried to pivot around supporting our businesses. But because we're a technology platform that's already driven out of mobile, Mm -hmm. um, we were in a very good position to make sure we could sell, serve our sellers quickly. Absolutely. And yeah, I was going to mention that too. So you're referencing the paycheck protection program, which was that huge small business emergency funding program the government rolled out a couple months ago. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this recently, but I would love to just hear kind of how that progress has been going for Square and, you know, how we've sort of seen the transition of this program from initially kind of addressing those largest businesses and then kind of opening up to, you know, the smaller ones that you guys specialize in. Yeah, I think when PPP was started, um, uh, Treasury and SBA released guidelines that were broad. I This is my assumption, thinking they broadly had to help small business. And as they started to see the evolution of who was using it and why they were using it first, I think that's why the larger businesses took it first. They were the most able and adept at having CFOs and sophisticated bookkeepers and um, law firms read the rules, interpret them, get an application in. And in addition to that, they already had lending relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I think the nature of those businesses is what drove the largest to show up in scale in that first program. What mm -hmm. I was very thankful for was that um, as more of those businesses were being examined and the question of like, is that who the program was tr truly designed for? within weeks of the government seeing that and the reaction publicly to who was getting those loans. The program took a very aggressive pivot to make sure that businesses understood that they need to attest to the need and the purpose mm -hmm. of the funds. And that dramatically changed the focus of who was taking these loans. In addition to that, Having players like Square in there, and we were approved as a lender on April 10th, mm -hmm. having players like Square in there enabled the democratization of the PPP to happen in a way that was different than someone who had a pre-existing lending relationship. Mm 
because now you could gain access to Square online, downloading an app and get a PPP application. Mm. Or you could be on Square and you'd see it on your dashboard. And we made the application very simple. We translated the language into words that anyone can understand so that all small businesses could see that they were able to get it. And we made sure they got through to the SBA quickly. Now that was not without hitches mm -hmm. and it was not without some confusion along the process um, as we were trying to figure out guidelines. I mean, we would literally have to communicate to small businesses. We don't know, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, um, which is a really hard thing to do. And I think thankfully, the SBA was willing to work with lenders like us because we distributed those loans in such scale, mm -hmm. but they were willing to work with lenders like us when we had questions. We could take those questions directly and have them answered very quickly by both Treasury and the SBA mm -hmm. so that we could help serve you know, non-employers with more clarity, uh, yeah. where some of the guidance was a, a little bit murky at first. Um, I know you and I have talked a lot about how there's still a lot to be done with this program. I mean, we're heading into the forgiveness portion, which essentially can turn these loans into grants. And, you know, that's had a lot of topic of discussion on, on, you know, Capitol Hill as well. And, you know, what do you kind of feel like needs to be changed for this program right now, especially since, you know, most of your businesses you lent to have been pretty small. I think you said your, you know, the vast majority of your loans were under $50,000. So what do you sort of see that still needs to be fixed here? Yeah, um, let me give you some stats and then I'm gonna make my plea on forgiveness. Um, so uh, we facilitated over 75,000 loans. We're one of the biggest lenders by count in the program. Our average loan size is $11,000. So it truly is serving Main Street. And two thirds of our borrowers were sole props, mm -hmm. which is also very different than most banks in America. And 47% of those loans went to zip codes where uh, inc the average income is less than $50,000. Mm -hmm. We're truly serving Main Street. And so with those sellers, we hear loud and clear, forgiveness, please let it be easy. And I have two, two topics there to talk about. One is the form itself is so complicated that it requires a math degree to understand. And so I beg anyone who is writing those laws to hand the application to their spouse and see whether their spouse can do the math and actually work through it or give it to their best friend. It's so hard. I hope, I hope that we are able to make that application easier and more understandable mm -hmm. uh, because right now it's super complicated. The second thing I see is that those businesses that were the most hurt so they had to let go of their employees for a period of time. They had to furlough. They had to contract because contraction meant survival. Mm -hmm. And then it'll take them some time to reopen. Those businesses actually right now get less forgiveness mm -hmm. than those who are less harmed. And so as much as I appreciate the purpose, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. I still think this, the, the purpose needs to appreciate that very small businesses, micro businesses across the United States have been hurt in lots of different ways. And I think over the long term, even though forgiveness was um, made easier with the 24 weeks of time to count, I still hope that's enough time for small businesses. And I hope that forgiveness takes into account a technically broader set of use cases for what the capital is needed and potentially even say, you know what, this business, this tiny micro business, that plumber, he's still in business and it might be slower and he might need more than the 24 weeks, but you know, we're going to make loans that are really small forgivable because we see that this is the lifeblood of the U S economy and this plumber is still back in business or this tiny restaurant or the five chair hair salon or the coffee shop, and if they're still in business and they're still serving our community, how do we make forgiveness easy? And so I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, I mean, do you expect all of your, your loans to be forgiven at this point? Do you kind of have that anticipation that those really small loans are just gonna be forgiven? 
I don't know. I sincerely don't know. And even with the flexible adjustments, the, and to me, the one that matters most is the 24 weeks. Yes. Yeah. It depends on how easy the application is, and it depends on whether uh, sellers are able to attest to things versus upload an intensive amount of documentation around rules that they potentially can't meet because in some cases they've been severely, severely impacted. Yeah, and I, I want to shift real quick, and I, I think this is a really important part. You mentioned that you know a lot of your loans have gone to you know a sort of underserved communities, and I think that's something that's a huge topic right now. Of course, with everything that's going on with this focus on racial injustice and equality, you know how how do you sort of use Square's role? First of all, you know what are you sort of doing in your own uh, within your own ranks to to sort of address that issue, and also sort of what's happening with you know sort of fintech's role in in sort of serving underserved communities. Yeah, I, I think one of the um, interesting dynamics of fintech and Square in particular operating in lending is that we have democratized the ability to access credit. 70% mm -hmm. of our sellers tell us they can't gain access to credit and credit is the lifeblood of starting, building and running a business. Mm -hmm. And I think once you're able to unlock access to credit, it opens up the aperture of a business's ability to operate. And so I'm very thankful that whether it be in a rural environment, in low income communities, in communities of color, in any underrepresented environment, we have facilitated lending in multiples to what most lenders are able to achieve across the country. So today, our core lending business, 55% of our loans are facilitated to women-owned businesses and 37% are facilitated to underrepresented minority-owned businesses. And those numbers, again, are multiples of what traditional lenders can achieve across the country. And oh. so I feel like we are we're trying to put our money where our mouth is with who we're lending to and make sure that we're able to have open access for loans to any small business in the country. Absolutely. I want to shift gears. We're running out of time here, but I want to shift gears quickly because this is a huge thing that I think is really going to be interesting to see how your business kind of deals with this, if this in the future. But, you know, you were recently approved uh, for a conditional FDIC bank charter. And so it's going to be Square the Bank. Um, so first, you know, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, what does this mean for Square? And then, you know, what does Square look like as a bank? You know, do you have, what's it going to look like? Yeah, let me make one distinction, um, which is Square will own a bank. We will not be a bank. And so uh, Square will be the parent company to Square Financial Services, uh, which is the ILC that we are starting in Utah. Uh, we expect the bank will be open before March of 2021, we have one year from that conditional approval date, mid-March, in order to open up that, um, in order to open up our bank. Um, you know, one of the things we saw, uh, which was the catalyst for uh, starting Square Financial Services, was that we had many businesses across Square that required a bank partner, and they required a bank partner to facilitate the compliance, the legal, the licensing, um, and many components of what a bank does. And so the more we looked into it and the, the larger our lending business became, the more we realized that we should own that direct relationship with our regulator. Mm -hmm. And it enables us to operate directly, understand their requirements, make sure we're having a day by day, week by week conversation, make sure we're reporting to our regulator and we are responsible for our own, um, our, own, our own fate and our own abilities to execute. What you'll see from us is first, you'll see a set of deposit products that we open the bank with and that would be a high yield savings account. And we're also gonna migrate our lending business to Square Financial Services. And so that will be the biggest component of what we start with. 
And then over time, you can just think of what Square could do uh, with broader financial services support of our sellers. Uh, and I think we'll be really proud to do that. PPP was one example of where we saw the demand from our sellers to provide better service around mm -hmm. banking. Right. Uh, so I think we'll be able to do that. Absolutely. But I want to leave you with one last question. And, you know, that's sort of thinking about everything we've been chatting about, you know, how do lenders now look at risk in this environment? And, you know, sort of what role does, you know, tech and data play in the way that the lending landscape sort of transforms over time? I think uh, one of the things that our uh, modeling has done in my mind is transformed the way underwriting happens fundamentally. It has traditionally on the consumer side been driven by FICO and on the business side been driven by intensive proprietary models based on asset securitizations, um, prior cash flow, years in business. And the machine learning models that we built that both risk rank and do predictive analytics around future earnings I think totally upend traditional models of underwriting and show that one size doesn't matter in lending. You could have a really tiny business and they could be an absolutely wonderful credit that should be eligible or business that should be eligible for credit and new doesn't matter. And so with machine learning models, we've been able to totally upend what has for uh, many years uh, been done in underwriting in most banks across the country. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Jackie, for joining me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.